Good afternoon. My name is Hilda Diaz Soltero, and I have the pleasure this afternoon to explain to you at the Department of Defense how to use a new tool, the Global Invasive Species Compendium. Invasive species are a global challenge, and they're recognized in all the continents in the world. This situation is aggravated by globalization, trade, mobility, and climate change. And invasives have a negative impact on both managed lands that produce agriculture, aquaculture, agroforestry, etc., as well as on natural areas, which are important because of their environmental quality and biological diversity. Why are we involved in this? Well, as you probably know, the US has an executive order that created the National Invasive Species Council. And the council wrote a National Invasive Species Management Plan, which guides the actions that are collaborative among two or more federal agencies. In the national plan, Action item number 53 stated, and I'm quoting, the National Invasive Species Council, led by the United States Department of Agriculture, will produce an invasive species compendium for North America. The compendium will include a broad array of searchable information le relevant to the biology, distribution, and management of invasive species. And this project will be undertaken in close cooperation with CABI. The scope of the compendium was changed at a later date, and we'll explain why. CAVI has a compendium program, and this is the fifth compendium. The first four were on crop protection, on forestry, on animal health and production, and on aquaculture. And this fifth one is on invasive species all over the globe. It's a project that is ongoing, at a cost of $4.75 million. This compendium is a new business model for CABI. In the force first compendia, the compendia consortium, which is the group of members that finance the creation of the compendium, finance the creation of the four compendia. But the sustainability is done by selling annual subscriptions to you, if you want to use it, to that compendium. In this one, on the Invasive Species Compendium, we have a different model. The consortium raised enough money to do both the compendium per se and to keep it sustainable and updated, free, for five years. So there's no cost for the use of this compendia. The other compendia you pay to use the Invasive Species Compendium, you have free access in the world. In the other compendia, you have an annual update. In the Invasive Species Compendium, you have a weekly update. The content of the other four compendia is very specific. It talks about crops, forest, animal health, and aquaculture. And they can include species that are in any taxa, but they're focused on those activities in managed lands and waters. Whereas in the invasive species compendium, we focus on the worst invasive species. What's worst? The ones that have the worst negative impact. They can be from any taxa, and they have that most negative impact on both natural or managed ecosystems. The scope of the first four compendia is managed lands and waters in very specific activities forestry, aquaculture, agriculture, so on. Whereas in the invasive species compendium, the scope is global. Any species, the species can be anywhere in the world, and species could affect any ecosystems. So the invasive species compendium is complementary to the four other compendia by CAVI. It is not duplicative. What are the key issues that we could use the compendium to address? We could use the compendium to assess and mitigate 
the impact of invasive species on their climate change scenarios. We could use the compendium information to increase the food production for food security. We could use the compendium to assess and minimize the use of invasives for bioenergy production. We can use the information to facilitate legislation, policy, or regulations. You can use it to facilitate agricultural trade among nations. And last but not least, you can use the information to avoid extinctions and protect biological diversity. In 2008, we had an inception workshop where all interested parties met, and there we discussed the coverage for the compendium. That's when we decided not to make a compendium for North America, like the management plan required, but to expand its scope and make it global. Why? Well, it didn't make sense to just make a compendium for Canada, US, and Mexico. Because we have invasive species go coming into these countries from all over the world and coming out of our countries to all over the world. So the scope was redefined as global. We decided to include all natural and managed ecosystems, but not human pathogens. That would be a separate compendium. The species that are invasive can be from all taxa. And we decided to focus on the species with the highest invasiveness and impact. When you go into the compendium, and we'll do that later in this presentation, the compendium is like an encyclopedia, and each one of the pages is called an invasive species data sheet. The data sheet has a st standard template, and the scientists that have written them have followed this template. We give you the identity of the invasive species with the names, both scientific and vernacular, in all different languages, and notes on its taxonomy. We tell you the geographic distribution of that species, both in a table, by country, and by province or state in the US, as well as maps. We give you the history of the introduction of that species and the spread of the species throughout the world. We talk about the phytosanitary risk it possesses. Then we go into the biology and ecology, including things like the habitat, genetics, reproduction and physiology, nutrition, habitat associations, environmental requirements for the species such as climate, soil, and water tolerance. That will be used in climate change later scenarios. We talk about the dispersal of the species. What are the pathways it uses? Is it in the trade? What are the vectors? And then we talk about the natural enemies of that species, where it comes from. Then we go into the negative impacts or the positive impacts of the species. We talk about the economic impact, the social impact, and the environmental impact in two areas. One, the impact to the habitats per se, and second, the impacts to specific species of the biological diversity. Those we we'll call threatened species. We also give you a summary of the invasiveness. Then we proceed to tell you how to manage that invasive species. And for those of you that are land managers, this is going to be a very important area. We talk about how to prevent the invasive species of getting from you, for you, uh, getting from where it is now to your site. We talk about how to control the invasive species. And we give you all the different options that are scientifically valid and have been proven to be properly and uh, properly controlling the invasive species. Those could be cultural measures, mechanical measures, biological control, chemical control, genetic control, or control by using the species. We talk about eradication, containment, and surveillance, as well as how to restore the ecosystem once you have gotten rid of the invasive species in the ecosystem. We have a 
place where we talk about gaps in scientific knowledge. When we do this um, data sheet, the scientists review everything that has been scientifically published about these species. And if there are some research needs, we will indicate those in these gaps in knowledge. We give you all the references uh, and the references that were used to make this data sheet and the illustrations. So what are the benefits of those of us that became a member of the Invasive Species Consortium? As I said, the consortium are the group of entities that are committed to finance and guide the program. First, together we achieved the completion of a key resource for invasive species management. None of us alone could have done this. We have a seat at the table to influence the direction of the project and interact with other consortium members, which are 27 organizations in 12 countries in the world. We got a lot of financial leverage for our investment. A modest investment for $175,000 by member or a $130,000 if you were an organization in a developing country secures the benefit of $4.75 million. $175,000 is 3.6%. So it's the equivalent of investing 3.6 cents and getting back a project that is worth $1. We had certainty of delivery. We have visibility because the members are participants of this cutting edge project. We had accessibility to the compendium while it was being developed. And now we have accessibility for everybody because it's up in the web. We will have continuous updating. And different from the other compendia by CAVI, the updating in the Invasive Species Compendium is done weekly. And we participate planning how to sustain and enhance the compendium. In terms of interaction, as colleagues, we have an opportunity to discuss common interests in an international forum of like-minded representatives working on invasive species. This is a list of the present uh, members of the consortium. As you see, they are either in the public sector, in green, in the private sector, in red, or in gray, those are government agencies interested in international development assistance. In terms of countries, we have Australia, Canada, the Caribbean islands, France, India, Malaysia, Mexico, Monsanto, Netherlands, Pacific Islands, Swiss, Syngenta, and the UK. And from the United States of America, you have the US Agency for International Development, various agencies in USDA, Agricultural Research, Animal and Plant Health Inspection, Foreign Agricultural Research Service, Forest Service, the Invasive Species Coordination Program in the Office of the Secretary, NRCS, and Rural Development. And last but not least, in NOAA, we have the National Ocean Service, and in the Department of the Interior, the US Fish and Wildlife Service. New members are being sought and welcomed. Now, how can your agency, the Department of Defense, use the Invasive Species Compendium? Here are some of the potential uses. If there are additional uses that I have not mentioned, feel free to give me a, send me an email. My contact information will be at the end of this presentation. And we can help you uh, identify how to use the compendium for that use. In the Department of Defense, you have to do NIPA. So you can use the information on these invasive species and the endangered species they affect, uh, as well as the general information on the invasive species on your environmental assessments and environmental impact statements of proposed projects or grants. You can use, use it on your Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultations with Fish and Wildlife or National Marine Fisheries Service. You can use it to evaluate and manage your invasive species that are coming into your land. So you can use it for prevention or you can use it for control of those invasive species. 
the species that are already established in your lands or in other locations where you are working. You can use the information on taxonomic identifications. We have a lot of taxonomic uh, um, tools to help you identify the invasive species in the compendium. You can inform your Department of Defense research. And in the future, you will be able to predict the invasive species range under climate change scenarios using the GIS layers for temperature, soils, rainfall, changes in pathways, etc. This will be available at the end of 2013. Now, let's go, David, to the live presentation, and we're going to go to the website www.cabi.org Invasive Species Compendium. Here's the website, and we are going to go slowly. The purpose of showing you this is to show you in detail the pieces of the Invasive Species Compendium, because later in the presentation, I'm going to show you which species, which pieces of the information on each species you can use to do the tasks that I just mentioned. So on the top, on the first page, you have the home page. If you go in the first column, there's an overview of the compendium. It tells you updates, the ones that are most recent. Why? Well, maybe you've already used the compendium and you're working on one species and a couple of months have gone by. You go back to the compendium and you look at the updates and see if there's any particular update that affects your species. There are training tools. This is a program to help you if you don't have the benefit of something like what I'm doing for you today, to be able to self-train on using the compendium. And it's also in Spanish. That's why it says capacitación. This is a very important feedback uh, loop so that if you have any questions, if you have any additional data, or if you have data that is contrary to what is in the Invasive Species Compendium, please tell us. CABI has uh, does review and answers each and every one of those. Now, when you're going to work on invasive species, maybe you are working only on a group of invasive species. So the ICS browse, the ISC browse allows you to go to groups of species if you're just interested in animals or bacteria or plants, etc. And look at the end, we have added the pathway causes and the pathway vectors. Because maybe you know that in your uh, DOD lands, you have a particular pathway uh, vector coming in or a pathway cause, and you don't have an idea exactly of who can come through that vector. You can go and analyze the information in the compendium of what are the species that use that pathway vector, okay? So it facilitates the work for you. On the top, in the horizontal way, we have the data sheets, and these are all the data sheets that are now in Compendia. The Compendium is in continuous weekly update, and we are always adding new information. There's two types of data sheets what we call a full data sheet with all the information that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, but also there's abbreviated data sheets. The abbreviated data sheets information is correct, but it has less information. So we're always adding and changing abbreviated data sheets or new invasive species and adding full data sheets to the compendium. We give you apps tracks to all the literature that you're going to see used in this compendium. So there are, uh, there's an abstract database and it can be searched. We also have a lot of documents in the library. These are documents that are relevant to invasive species and you can scan them or you can download them. There's a glossary because People with different backgrounds will be using this compendium. So if you get to a word in the data sheet that you really 
are not familiar with. You highlight it and you hit it once and it takes you to a glossary which will define that world word for you. There are there's search mechanisms. You can do site search. You can do an advanced data sheet search. And there's search help. And I could type it in any language. It will get me to the same site, okay? We did this because if, you know, if you're a scientist, maybe you know the latest taxonomy. If you're a scientist in a developing country, maybe you know an old name. If you are a farmer or working in the Agricultural Extension Service, maybe you know the name only in that language. Any of those ways, when you type it in, you will be able to get to the uh, specific one. So here it is. It's looking for everything that has a fallopia, okay? And this will show that I want fallopia japonica, Japanese knotweed. Okay, so I'm going to get Sorry, here it is. I'm going to hit Fallopia Japonica. That's the one that I want. And here's the invasive species data sheet for Fallopia Japonica. As I mentioned before, you're going to have pictures. If you don't like that picture, you double click on the picture and a group of pictures comes up. You will be able to copy and download those pictures. I'll show you at the end when we write a report. Okay, you will have a map. That map is changed as you are loading the website because the maps are the things that are changed quickest. And then you have a data sheet which the date of when it was last modified. So the cover will tell you, okay, this is a data sheet. It's an invasive species data sheet and it's also a pest data sheet. Why do we tell you the type? Because there will be other data sheets in this compendium. There will be a native uh, species data sheet. There will be a natural enemy data sheet. There will be threatened species by the invasive species data sheet. So if you are working immediately you know you are on the invasive species here. So Again, we'll tell you the preferred scientific name. Okay, we'll tell you, let's go to the identity. Okay, I'm going to go now into what it says. It tells you the preferred scientific name, and that's the last taxonomically correct name, and the preferred common name in English. All the other scientific synonymia for the names and then the international common names are in their language. French, New Zealand, uh, USA. Look at all of the different names that, depending upon where in the US, you have for this uh, species. And if it's a plant, like this one is a plant, we give you the EPPO code, the European Plant Protection Organization code, so that you can look the information up there. Then, we give you the notes on the taxonomy and nomenclature for that species. 
And look how this is written up. It's written up with citations. So look at the second sentence. It was not until the early part of the 20th century that these were discovered to be the same plant. Parenthesis, Bailey, 1990. So if I hit Bailey, 1990, okay, that will take me to the citation of the abstract of the publication of Mr. Bailey in 1990. If I click it twice, it will take me to the full report of Mr. Bailey in 1990. Some of you which are scientists or working on things like biological control may want to see the full, uh, but the full uh, scientific information. Then we talk about the description of the plant. And this is important because it will help you make sure that you are identifying the correct plant as the invasive species. And we give you some of the characteristics of the plant. This one is broadleaf, herbaceous, perennial, shrub, and vegetatively propagated. On the images, we give you pictures of different stages of the plant. And like I said earlier, these pictures can be copied and placed in your report. Here's your report tab at the end. And so we welcome you copying the information and copying the images and the maps. Let's go then to the distribution of the invasive species. This distribution information is what is being used to form the map that you saw in the first cover sheet. So talks about the distribution, and then we have a distribution table which is organized first by continent, Asia, then by country, China, and we'll tell you then in China by province. We have the information to the province level in China, Japan, Mexico, and Canada. In the states, it's by state. In other countries that are smaller, the information will be just by country, but we'll tell you who whether it's present there or not, whether it's native, this one is native to China. So is it invasive there? No, it's not invasive in China. Who said so in the scientific literature? The latest is a USDA Agricultural Research Service 2003 publication. So this will take you then down through the different Okay, all of that is China, and then here we are in uh, America, the US, then South America, see Chile, then Europe, and see as each one of them will tell us whether it's present or not, whether it's a native or introduced, whether it's invasive or non-invasive, and will tell us who has given us that information. If it's in black, like in Belgium, that means that the citation Van Rompuy and Devilsville 79, it's in full text, okay? So we'll keep on going. And then we talk about what's the history of this plant? How did it distribute itself from the places where it was native, China, Japan, Korea, into the rest of the world? And what did it do so? And how did it do so? So this is the history of introduction and spread. And then, if we have additional information on the introductions, we will also provide that for you. So that you can then see here, introduced to the Czech Republic from Japan, the year and what purposes, and then the citation. We'll finish with a statement about the risk for introducing this into new places. Is it easy to be introduced? Is it hard? So where are the worst vectors where it can be introduced? Then we go into the biology and ecology of the invasive species. We talk about the habitat first. What is the habitat where it's found? And then we give you a habitat list of the habitats that it likes. 
we divided this by three categories, either littoral habitats, terrestrial managed habitats, or terrestrial natural and semi-natural habitats. That is to make it easier for land managers who know what their land base is to go immediately into the kind of habitats that they have in their lands. We tell you the habitat, whether it's present or not, and then if it's harmful. Harmful would be, is it considered invasive or is it considered the best? We then go into any hosts or species that are affected. <coughs> and then into the biology and ecology of the species, where we will discuss the genetics of it, we will discuss the reproductive biology, physiology and phenology, associations, the environmental requirements that it likes. And for the environmental requirements, we will give you the climate type that it prefers or it tolerates you see the status, preferred or tolerates, and then we give you a description of that climate type. This is very important information when you're trying to do prevention work and you're saying, okay, I don't have that invasive species yet in my uh, lands, but I could get it. You would look at the climate type and the climate information, and you would look at the soils that this invasive species likes, and then you would put it in the GIS system, and you would say to the computer, computer, tell me all the other places in the US where we have the same climate and the same soils. And the computer will shadow those for you, and so you can see whether those shadowed areas are where your lands are, and you would have the probability, if that invasive species would were to come, it could be established in your lands. That's very, very useful. We tell you about the latitude of the species, but we also tell you about the altitude of the species, because those two parameters make a big difference. We tell you the air temperature that it likes. We tell you the rainfall or snowfall that it likes. And if this is a plant, so we have also the soil tolerance for it. Then we tell you about who are the natural enemies for the species? As you probably know, natural enemies are other species that in the native range of the invasive species would have kept that species at bay so that it would not be invasive in their native habitat. These are natural enemies. And we give you a table with the different natural enemies that have been scientifically proven to be effective natural enemies of Fallopia japonica. Each one of these is in blue. What that means is that if I hit Acidium polygonicus pidati, it will bring up a data sheet for natural enemies telling me all the information on this Acidium polygonicus pidati. The natural enemies table is going to be very important to people looking for biological controls or for uh, uh, other na natural controls. We then go into notes about the natural enemies. What is known about them? We talk about the means of moving and dispersing that this invasive species uses. It could be a natural dispersal. It could be vector transmitter, biotic. It could be an accidental introduction. It could be an intentional introduction. And if it's an intentional introduction, then we will give you the pathway causes. There's a difference between pathway cause and pathway vectors, which is below. The cause is a botanical garden wanted to have all of these plants, and it brought Fallopia japonica to our country to show it off in the botanical garden. That's the pathway cause. However, the pathway vector is how did that plant come? Did it come on purpose, intentional introduction to be planted in the botanical garden? Or was it in the debris of some other plants 
the seeds could have been in the debris or the soil of some other plant that was imported into the botanical garden. And so the debris could have been the vector. So you realize these are uh, different things. But they're very, very well uh, related. And if you're looking at pathways, you look both at the cause and at the vectors. We tell you the nodes, whether the pathway cause is long distance or local, or both. Then we do the same thing with the pathway vectors. Furthermore, this is a plant that could hitch piggyback on another plant that is a good plant and it's in horticultural trade. And the invasive species could be hitchhiking on the other plant. So if this is a situation, we'll tell you the other plant parts that are liable to carry these invasive species in the trade or transport. You know, if you're worried about fallopia, look at the planting trade at the bulbs, the tubers, the growing medium, the roots, and the true seeds. Because it could be hitchhiking on those parts of the other plant. But we also tell you which parts are not known to carry the invasive species. This is important information for people that are doing phytosanitary analysis so that they focus their looking for the invasive plant only on the parts that are uh, really capable of bringing the invasive plant. Okay. So now let's go to the impacts section. In the impacts section, I'm going to give you both negative impacts and positive impacts. And this is very important because when you do an environmental impact statement, as you know, you have to do a pro-con analysis. And you have to show what are the negative impacts, but if there are any positive impacts, you also have to show them. And then make your decision balancing those two inputs. So let's go to the impact summary. We give it to you in a summary and first tell you in a very short, quick way, does it affect biodiversity? Yes, and the impact is negative. And cultural, negative. Environment, negative. Economic, negative, and so forth and so on. The category of impacts may vary depending on the invasive species. Some may not affect tourism, but some may affect the ocean. You know, so you have a, you have to, these, these categories specific for these invasive species. The hardest part to write here is the economic impact, but we will give you anything and everything that is in the proven scientific literature up to now from 1890. CABI has access to all scientific literature in all countries, in all languages, since the beginning of, of uh, publishing. Uh, scientific reviews. So we'll give you all of that information, and some of it will be in uh, lira, some of it will be in euro, some of it will be in, in uh, US dollars, but we will tell you who said so and what information they have on their impact. We then talk about the environmental impact, and as I said before, it's both the environment impact on the habitats, as a habitat per se, or whether it's a specific impact on the biological diversity of the site. We are expand expanding the impact on biological diversity with a special project that is now being funded by USDA. We would love to invite DOD to participate, where we have identified all of the endangered species that are affected by an invasive species. Do you know what the percentage is? 66% of endangered species have one or more invasive species affecting them. The worst ones are in Hawaii and in the Caribbean archipelago. Then we are trying to gather that information so that you would have under the impacts to biodiversity a little table saying the name of the endangered species or threatened species or candidate species, why uh, you know, who says it's important, in this case the Endangered Species Act, what is the invasive species affecting it, what are the mechanisms the invasive species uses to affect the endangered species, which are the references, so that you can then link management of your endangered species or threatened species 
in your Department of Defense activities, when you have to do Section 7 consultations, to the specific impact that this invasive species will give to it. We talk about the social impact to the invasive, uh, that the invasive species has, and then we talk about the risk and impact factors. Why is it invasive? These invasiveness are characteristics of the organism. It's fast growing, highly adaptable, long lived, okay? But then when it impacts something, it has an outcome. So this is the impact outcome. When it has an impact, it can alter traffic levels. It can create conflict. It can damage ecosystem services. And what are the impact mechanisms that it uses to do that? It's alleliopathic, it uses competition, has rapid growth, and then we tell you whether it's likely to enter a country and whether it's easier not to control it. So you have there all of the negative things that this particular species can do. Now we're going to give you the positive things, okay? So that when you do your EIS or your EA, you can have the pro-con analysis of the bad things and the good things. So how is it used? Look at the economic value. It has social benefit. It has environmental services. And look at all of the ways in which this Fallopia japonica can be used in the botanical gardens and zoo, as chemicals or pesticides, as biofuels, etc., etc. So with, again, with all of this information, which is science-based citations from the published agreed scientific literature, you can produce a very good document to either uh, manage it or to be able to justify it. So let's go to the management of this invasive species. Now we're dealing with it, it's in our place, and we have to deal with that. How do I detect that it's here? How do I inspect for it, okay? Is it similar to another species? Because I want to be sure that I'm dealing with the invasive species and not confusing it with another very similar species. So we give you ways to differentiate between the invasive species, Fallopia japonica, and other Fallopias that are similar. Then we tell you how can I prevent and control the invasive species. Phytosanitary measures, how do I do a rapid response if it's just hit us and we have a small population of them and we can, uh, we can, we can avoid it? Okay. How do I make the public aware of these species? Is there good awareness or not? How do I eradicate it from a place that I uh, have it? Then I provide all of the ways in which you can control it. Cultural, sanitary measures, physical or mechanical control, biological control, chemical control. In this chemical control section, I will provide the chemical components of a particular chemical com uh, control that is effective. We will not use brand names. So, you know, I will not say Roundup. But I, instead, I will say the chemical um, formulation of Roundup. We do that because you have to get, remember this is a global compendium, and you have to have a person in the country, on the site, that is very aware of what the local rules and regulations are, tell you whether Roundup is accepted or not. Maybe Roundup is okay in the U.S., but maybe India doesn't accept Roundup. Well, he would know that, and maybe the product accepted in India with a similar uh, co chemical composition as Roundup is called something else. So there's a place for the local knowledgeable manager to make those kinds of decisions. Also, this pulls us back from being proponents of any particular uh, 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 chemical control. And remember, 
this is being weekly updated. So if the chemical control is for some reason found not to be appropriate because of damage to the environment or damage to humans and pulled out of the um, tools that we can use, we will update the information for you. We'll tell you what are the inf uh, integrated pest management programs that can be used to control these species. And then we'll tell you how to control it by using it. Ways to monitor or surveil it, ways to mitigate its damage, and ways in which you can conduct ecosystem restoration. And then, last in that section, we'll tell you scientific gaps in knowledge, so that if you're a researcher looking for additional research needs, there's one in which if you would work in this issue, you would be making a lot of uh, uh, good for the world. We tell you all the references that were used in making this data sheet. Again, those that are in black are just the reference for the abstract. Those are in blue are the reference for a full text. First the abstract, two clicks, the full text. This reference is updated whenever the scientist updates the data sheet. So let's go first to the cover. And you remember that it says here, last modified 20 October 2011. This is how a data sheet is written. The data sheet, uh, CABI identifies using the literature who are experts on this species. And let's imagine for a minute here that Pete Egan is an expert on Fallopia japonica. So CABI contacts Pete Pete Egan and he agrees for a modest amount of funds to write the Fallopia Japonica data sheet. He does so. Cabi will send him all the abstracts and all the world literature since the beginning of time for him not to have to do that, you know, in Google. And he will have all of that data in front of him. And then he will follow this um, way of informing that data sheet. When Peter finishes, Cabby will create what I call the peer review group. And you know, Hilda and Mary and John are three other scientists that work on Fallopia Japonica and they are contacted to be the peer reviewers of Peter's data sheet. And we do so. And then there's back and forth between these three reviewers and Peter until everybody's agreeing that the document is good to go. That gets sent to CABI. Then editors that are experts in those taxa groups edit it and Peter works with the people in pictures. There's over 4,000 pictures available. And Peter says, well, for Fallopia, I want these three pictures, okay? And he selects the pictures from the uh, CABI pictures. CABI has solved the issue about um, uh, copyright with the pictures. And then last but not least, the distribution map gets formed. Peter finished this with Cabi on the 20th of October 2011 in this example. But Cabi, since they receive the information on what's published in the world every week, this week they received a paper in the journal Nature, I'm inventing all of this, it's just an example, about Fallopia Japonica. Immediately, we send it to Pete. Pete is our Fallopia Japonica guy. Hey Pete, look at this. Is there anything you think we need to change in the Invasive Species Compendium data sheet? He may say, no, it's more of the same. We don't, I would just add the citation in the references and in this sentence and in this sentence. That's it. That's a minor revision. But it may be something completely new, a big breakthrough. We have a new biological control for Fallopia japonica. And Pete says, you know what? I have to revise the whole section on impacts and the whole section on management to include this new information on biological control. Pete goes ahead, does it, the same peer review group peer reviews it, and the process is repeated again. And as soon as that information is 
finalized, it goes live up any day of the year as soon as it's finalized. So you can see how intense and how important the updating is on this compendium. That was one of the difficult things we found in other compendia before we started doing this project. So I am going to go now to the part on top that says report. That's the last tab. Please pay attention. This is very important for you to make use of the compendium. On the left hand side, I have the titles of the different sections that we just saw. And depending upon what you want to use this for, you will select different sections. Let's imagine I'm the invasive species uh, team leader in one of the army bases, and I have 10,000 hectares, and I have Fallopia japonica. And what I want to do in this report is I want to provide the people that are going to use control mechanisms information about what is the species, what it looks like, the common name in English, we're in the US, and then three control methods they could use to control them in my 10,000 hectare base, okay? So I want the identity, blue, and I hit the blue, the right button. That means copy it on the right. I'm copying all the information that I want. I want the description. Yes, they need to understand how it looks. And then I'm not worried about the history of introductions or introduction. I'm worried about the habitats. Okay, because in 10,000 hectares I have many habitats and I only want it treated in its habitat, okay? And then I'm going to go into none of, none of this stuff, uh, dispersal climate type. <coughs> I'm going to go into means of movement and then I want to see I know that it, it has many impacts, but that's not important to the people that are going to do this kind of work. I want to use control, prevention and control, okay? So then, I, as I hit all of these, I should have hit the right one, okay? So let's go back, prevention and control, and we're going to do, um, the habitats, okay? And then, if I want to remove anything from here, I can do that, you know? See, remove sections. I could hi highlight one and hit remove, okay? And do it. And then, I say generate the report. And the compendium has generated for me a report only with those parts of the information that I want to use. And then this is in a format that you can edit. So you just want, you know, the preferred common name, you can edit preferred scientific name out, other scientific names out, and all the international common names out, okay? So you can add and delete, and then do this. You can add the photographs, and you can then do a handout to give to the five men and women that are going to actually do the control of Alopia japonica using one of the three methods. So as you can see, this part of the compendium is very, very useful because it will give you the ability to create your reports that then you can photograph uh, you can use the photographs, the maps, all the information. You can edit it to your needs, and then you can provide this to your staff that is doing the work. This can be used in other uh, ways for other kinds of things. So let's go back now to our PowerPoint. <coughs> And 
and see how can the people in the Department of Defense use the information on the data sheet. Okay, the first way you can use it is in your EIS or Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultation. What information would I get from the compendium if I am doing an EIS or a Section 7 consultation? I can get the invasive species impacts on the humans, habitat, or biodiversity. Because in the search, I can search for the invasive species. And then I can go into the impacts section, OK? I can look for the evidence of scientific in, of specific impacts to the endangered, threatened, or candidate species. Remember the impacts to biodiversity? That section will tell me. I can look at the invasive species preferred habitat in the compendium. And do that, does that habitat match the endangered species habitat that is preferred? I can look at the invasive species biology and ecology and the invasiveness traits. I can look at the information on biological control of the invasive species. And with that information, is there any evidence that biological control can harm the endangered species? I can look at the impact of the control methods on the endangered species. And I can look at the impacts of the invasive species and add those impacts up to other cumulative impacts, including the economic impact, to the endangered species. So as you see, there's a lot of information on the ISC that you can pull out and then just copy and cite in your EIS or your Section 7 consultation. Now, we also thought that you could use the compendium to evaluate invasive species coming into your lands or waters, and that's the prevention task, and in other locations. So to be able to do that, what information do you want to ga gather from the compendium? You want to use the compendium for the taxonomic identification and the species that are look-alike, the invasive species, but are not invasive. You want to use the pathway vectors and identify which are the pathways of highest concern for that invasive species. And are they coming into your uh, lands? Are those pathways present? Deal with the pathway causes, OK? So deal with what the things that are causing the species to be able to come through that pathway. You're going to use the GIS information on the parts of the invasive species that are going to be carried in trade. And you can create and share handouts on the information in the ISC, including photos, species identification clues, and contact information to notify the authorities, you in DOD and the other pertinent authorities, that you have these new invasive species in your lands or waters. But the compendium can also help you manage the invasive species that are already established. So they can help you because they have information on how to manage the invasive species so that you can protect the biodiversity and endangered species in your lands. They can help you because they will give you all the different options that are open to you to manage and control the invasive species. And they can help you because since you have all the options in front of you, you can select options that minimize costs and negative impacts to both humans and the environment. The compendium can inform Department of Defense research. It can provide immediate access to updated scientific information, saving the scientists time and cost. Just as an aside, before Australia joined this compendium, they did a cost-benefit analysis. And in one small lab with just 50 scientists, they looked at how much money was saved by having them, by giving them access to a compendium. It saved them 1.2 million US dollars a year. 
because that's time that the scientists would go straight to the compendium for the updated information rather than going and starting to Google every time they started on a new task. So it saves time and cost, which is very valuable for the scientists. It helps identify research needs. Remember, we have an, a, a gaps in research section. It gives the names of the scientists that are working on a species. If you go to the references, you have there all of the names of the people that are working on that same species. And they can access the abstracts or the full text in scientific journals. In the future, at the end of this year, we're going to have a better tool, we have one now, to predict the invasive species range under climate change scenario. <coughs> What's there now? There's a tool that you can ask the temperature, the rainfall, if this is a plant, the soils, to be layered on the map. And the computer will transcribe that into Earth Google and will tell you either in the US or whatever range you want to see what where is it available. <coughs> it will show you the range that is occupied now by the invasive species and in a different color the other lands or waters that have a similar climate and could be hosting that invasive species if it came to them. In the future, under in 2013, at the end of 2013, we're going to also have a system that can incorporate that and do it in scenarios so that you could tell the computer, OK, this is where Fallopia hyponica is now, in 2012. What if we had hotter and drier uh, scenario? 3 degrees centigrade hotter minus 6 inches of rain drier. Where would Fallopia hyponica go? And it will show you that scenario in climate change of where the potential places where Fallopia can go. So this also, to be able to predict the range under climate change scenarios, you can use the pathway causes and the pathway vectors. Maybe there's a pathway vector now that disappears with climate change. You don't have to worry about that. Or the contrary. Maybe there's a vector that is not present now, but with climate change will be available. And these invasive species can use that vector. Now, there are many other federal agencies. I'll go quickly through this. For this part of the presentation, I'm only saying the tasks of the agencies where they can use the Invasive Species Compendium. If you are interested in the layout of the parts of the compendium for any one of the tasks, please send me an email and I'll give you that detail. But I have made this presentation specifically for each agency so for APHIS, I have all of the different species of the compendium that would help them prepare and implement regulations. But because of time constraints, I'm going to just uh, talk about the tasks. Well, APHIS can use the compendium to prepare and implement regulations, to evaluate invasive species coming into the US, to provide information for their staff and state staff for early detection and rapid response efforts, EFIS is responsible that it trains the inspectors on over 375 ports in the U.S. And they can use the compendium to prevent entry of invasive species into the U.S. They can use the taxonomic identification as well as um, in, in the ports, as well as other EFIS staff that works with identification and agricultural research scientists that work on taxonomy. They can use the invasive species compendium doing risk assessments. They can use it on environmental NEPA uh, assessments or impact statements. 
and they can use it under the ESA Section 7 consultation of proposed projects or regulations. And in the future, they'll be able to better predict the range under climate change scenarios. USAID has shared this information with other, other countries to help them increase agriculture, forestry, and aquaculture production, and thus have more food security. They have shared the information to help them to protect their biodiversity and to provide options to manage invasives and minimize costs and impacts to humans on the or the environment when managing invasives. The Agricultural Research Service uses it for all of the scientific needs of their scientists. And those are the same needs that I discussed for the DOD scientists. Foreign Agricultural Service mission is to help promote the sale of U.S. agricultural products in the world. So the compendium helps them by educating farmers so that they can control invasive species before they send their products on international trade. But then they're going beyond and they're using the compendium to train people in other countries train their phytosanitary staff and their port inspectors to use the compendium so that it facilitates the entry of U.S. products and facilitates the exports of the products in that country to the U.S. but free of invasive species. Rural Development is a unique USDA entity. They finance a lot of the activities in the rural areas in the U.S. They provide money and grants for schools, for uh, highways, for uh, electricity, water systems. And so when they do a project, they have to use the information on invasive species on their NEPA and ESA documents. And also, they own most of the land under which then private companies can put the electric utility uh, corridor so that they have to manage that corridor because it has to be kept open and guess what goes in there a lot invasive plant species so rural development uses it for that the forest service has four programs and each one uses the compendium in a different way the program that has the national forests uses it for control of the invasive species and prevention and the part that is research uses it for the next four uh, things. Same use as for the researchers in DOD. In the people that have to do environmental assessments and Section 7 consultation use it as well. And then they have a responsibility to share information with state foresters and private forest land owners to manage invasive species. So they will share that information Usually it's been the information having to do with the uh, invasive species management. And then their international program is mainly focused on invasive species. So using the compendium, they can focus on the invasive species that are in places with, our, with similar climate as we do, like China, and uh, then look at the things that are still in China and prevent they're coming in here. They focus uh, that collaborative work with China and they focus their work using the invasive species compendium. The Natural Resource Conservation Service mission is to assist private landowners in farms and ranches in the US and they provide both funding and technical assistance. So that technical assistance to prevent and control invasive species will use the compendium. They have a plants database, which is the database of the native plants in the US. And there's a piece of that database that talks about the invasive species affecting those plants. So these two databases work very well together. They have to use information on NEPA compliance and on ESA compliance as well. Our USDA coordination program in the Office of the Secretary has helped us establish a huge network of people and organizations to synergize, synergize work on invasive species and raise funds. 
It helps us refine and establish USDA priorities, and the Invasives Causing Extinction Program is helping us to look at the specific impact of invasive species in the U.S. that are affecting either endangered, threatened, or candidate species. And that's a Section 781 uh, and recovery effort for us in USDA. The National Ocean Service in the Department of Commerce manages waters and wetlands. So they have scientists, and the scientists use the scientific information in compendium in the same way that the scientists in other agencies do. Those are the four, first four points. But then they have responsibility in NOS for marine and estuarine sanctuaries. So there they use this information to prevent or control the invasive species in those marine and estuarine sanctuaries. And they have responsibility with coastal states around the US and the uh, Pacific and Caribbean territories. And they share information with the states for the coastal zone management programs. The Fish and Wildlife Service in the Department of the Interior, um, as well as APHIS, has used the compendium for regulatory issues. Uh, they have to implement in the Fish and Wildlife Service the Lazy Act, and they can designate a species that is not yet in the U.S. as an injurious species to wildlife or fish. And so what they've seen is that the ISC has the best updated science on the species that is invasive in other parts of the world and is still not in the U.S. So they change the way that they do their regulations and now instead of taking five and a half years and ten million dollars to do four snakes as injurious species, they just go to the invasive species compendium, they put a federal register notice with a preamble, they will download all the information on the invasive species that is not yet in the U.S. and they'll ask for public comment. And in three to six months, they can do a Lacey Act regulation at a lot less cost. But also, Fish and Wildlife has na national wildlife refuges. And they are full of invasive species, both aquatic and terrestrial. So they use the compendium to prevent and control the, in the, the invasive species. And also, they are very much into anticipating what will happen to the refuges with climate change and they can do that modeling using information from the compendium. And they have to do ESA Section 7 consultations whenever they're going to do an action in the wildlife refuge that may impact an endangered species. So I want to invite you to go to the website cavi.org slash ISC and use the invasive species compendium. You can access the updated scientific information in full data sheets on over 1,500 invasive species in the world from all taxa in both managed or natural ecosystems. You have access to basic data sheets of over 7,000 species. You have 75,000 abstracts of published literature. You have full text of over 1,000 relevant publications. And you have over 4,000 images and updated maps. Again, it's free, it's available to you, it's updated weekly, and it has powerful research and browse facilities. So use, copy, and share the information to benefit your work in the Department of the Interior on Invasives. These are, this is my contact information. Feel free to send me an email or to use the feedback loop if it's an issue that CABI needs to deal in fixing information on the invasive species compendium. And with that, I am happy to then see, go back and see if any of you have any questions, and I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thank you.